all these forms of resentment and uh, you know the idea that if men gain, women lose, or if women gain, men lose. I'm very critical of that that idea. Um, but we've seen all these discussions of like toxic masculinity and you know these sort of sweeping claims about basically how all men are evil. You know, and I, I think this is like really really unhelpful for everybody, and it's simply not true. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kisson. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our brilliant guest today is a philosopher, social commentator, and the author of What Do Men Want? Nina Powell, welcome to Trigonometry. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to have you on. Uh, look, before we get into the interview itself, uh, we're obviously, we've known you for a long time and it's been a long time coming, you coming on the show, but I've always said to you, when you finish your book, let's get you on. So we know you very well, but for anyone who doesn't know you, who are you? How are you where you are? What has been your journey through life that leads you to be sitting here talking to us about this on camera? Uh, well, I got the train. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before that, I was an academic. I taught philosophy at uh, the University of Roehampton for 13 years and various other places. I still teach a bit of philosophy, uh, largely to retired adults, and also in this brave new world of post or para-academia, um, which people are exploring now. So people just signing up for courses on anything that interests them. Mm. Um, and I'm very keen to break out of this academic world and, and you know, uh, do things in that way. So I left uh, academia maybe like three years ago, mm. two and a half years ago, and I write for various publications, including The Telegraph. And I, yeah, I largely spend my time walking about and thinking and reading and writing. And you are a very thoughtful person. And I, <laughs> before we started, I was just, I, we were chatting about some of the controversies around your book and things that we'll talk about. And I was just saying that, like, to me, you were just like my lovely friend Nina that I see uh, every few months and we have a chat about philosophy or something else. But it turns out you are super controversial and people are trying to cancel your book before they've even read it and stuff. Yeah, no, no. Well, I think this is quite a common experience now, um, particularly <laughs> for, for women, uh, you know, particularly for women trying to think in the public sphere. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a crazy, it's a crazy, crazy time. And, you know, I was kind of uh, very involved in leftist and activist politics, particularly around the um, student fee increase. So 2009, 2010 in particular. And I was very involved in defending people who'd been arrested and, and um, prosecuted and uh, I would say persecuted. Um, and at that point, I think the left understood who our enemies were, right? Like it was the state, it was the police, it was the courts. You know, we were fighting uh, for free education, um, for kind of universal access and all of these sorts of things. And then between then and now, something really weird happened. And I mean, I think the left always kind of fragments and turns on itself. But I think it did that in a kind of turbocharged, really deranged way. Um, and it stopped really being about compassion and discussion and um, solidarity and disagreement, actually, and all of the things that that I remember of the left and, you know, humour would be a big part of it. And actually lots of post-Christian virtues or Christian virtues like um, forgiveness and, you know, all these things seem to have been kind of abandoned uh, in the sort of hyper-internet age. And um, yeah, so, so I mean, a few years ago now, I said something, I was a member of the Labour Party, not a particularly active member, but uh, nevertheless, I posted something on Facebook about how the Labour Party seemed to be treating its female members um, who were raising questions about proposed changes to the Gender Recognition Act with um, total disrespect. You know, they were being interrogated and kicked out of the party. And I, I was just like, what's going on? This is like Orwellian uh, <laughs> <laughs> overuse. But, um, and I posted that and I sort of thought, oh, maybe that'd be a bit controversial. Um, but that's how I felt. You know, I was just sick of this stuff. It's like, you know, we should be able to discuss everything, particularly policy, ideas, thoughts. You know, we do disagree. Like that's the nature of humanity, like is disagreement. And we have to negotiate that. Um, and then, yeah, so I got kind of targeted, I suppose, by sort of activists. And yeah, lots of uh, my, I lost lots of work. I lost loads of friends. Um, I like when I give talks, sometimes people hire security guards to, to protect me in case anyone wants to attack me. Uh, yet the book, uh, people try to preemptively cancel it without having read it uh, by, by emailing the, uh, the publisher and 
yeah, I mean, I, like, like lots of people now, I routinely get kind of called like a fascist or a Nazi or an anti-Semite or a Terv or a transphobe or whatever. Welcome you know. home. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's like, you know, and it, it's, it's obviously insane. And actually, it's terribly disrespectful to these words to misuse them. I mean, it's like, you know, those, these things have a historical specificity and a political reality. And, mm. you know, I mean, this is like fucking infantile, sorry. No, no you, you're allowed to swear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking no, go for it. No, no, it's like I actually try not to swear in general. I think it like debases language. But um, yeah, anyway, it's you, you, you know very well. I'm sure, like the kind mm. of guests you have, and yeah. So, so this is where we find ourselves. So yes, um, I'm interested in dialogue, you know, mm. and I think that's the only way we can kind of move forward, whether it's between men and women, or left and right, or whatever. What do you, what do you think the left isn't interested in dialogue anymore? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. It's, it's, yeah, certainly turned its back on any kind of philosophical aspect. Um, I think it, it sort of internalised the idea that it's weak, you know, and, and far from understanding the fact that it actually controls all of the institutions, um, culturally at least, um, it, sort of, it sort of permanently imagines itself to be the underdog and therefore it's okay because everyone else is, is the oppressor. So it doesn't matter if you lie about them you know, because they're your enemy or um, this kind of thing. But I don't know. I mean, some people would say it's not really what's going on. It's not really the left, you know, that it's something else. Like, mm -hmm. because it certainly isn't the left that most people I know who were or are on the left uh, remember or feel that they're part of. Like, it's, it's kind of lost its humanity somehow. It's a really good point because they do love to dehumanise. They do love to use certain words. Just a couple of days ago, a Labour MP was being interviewed by Julia Hartley Brewer, and she was asking him very sensible questions about mask wearing. He was saying that he wears a mask. She was like, what studies can you draw from that proves mm. that masks are effective? And he said something along the lines of, well, we're not going to have any of this anti-vax nonsense at the moment. Before saying, I feel the <laughs> mask works. A sensible approach to wearing masks on public transport and particularly... A sensible and, <laughs> approach would involve evidence that they made a difference. Have you ever seen any of that evidence? I haven't. I feel they've made a difference. You I, feel I, they've made... Oh, well, in that case, Jonathan, do you look, feel... I, do, I mean, if that's, if that's the way we make decisions about people's freedoms in this country, if Jonathan Reynolds feels they make a difference... But I just on. feel, throughout things like this, I know it's not your position, but people like me have followed the scientific and medical advice and voted in I'm parliament. asking you for... The, no, no, no. <laughs> Someone saying you should do this is not the I same as them producing I evidence for that. How it affects my breathing and the transmission of, of material from your mouth. Of course it's had an effect. So look, what do you mean, I, I of course it's had an effect? Numerous scientific studies have been done and none of them have shown any significant effect, if any at all. Well, I, I feel it's been of you benefit. You feel... Well, you look, feel. Just, this sort of tedious anti-vax stuff, anti- Excuse me? There, there Excuse are... me, Jonathan Reynolds? How dare you? How dare you? I am so fed up, and so are my listeners. I'm asking you to produce the scientific basis for you claiming that you feel a policy works when it's a massive infringement on civil liberties. And you've just basically accused me of being anti-vax. I am double vaccinated. I have always encouraged people to get the vaccination. That is an outrageous thing to say. I am so fed up of that. Yeah, okay, but this is just strange, you know, this is religious belief and, and that's disrespectful to, to religion, frankly. Mm. The thing is, it's like if you want to convince your uh, enemy or someone you disagree with of your position, you have to be able to argue it, mm. you know, and the idea that you can just kind of like steamroll your way through a conversation by repeating mantras, you know, mm. this is a cult, like this is not a rational dialogue between adults, mm. right? This is people who are just kind of, um, I don't know, being insanely dogmatic, you know, and, and everybody's capable of reason and thought and discussion, like mm. this is what it is to be alive. Right, and and this way of being is extremely unpersuasive. It converts no one. It just reinforces the, the strength of feeling within your own tribe. And that's one of the things I'm really interested to talk to you about with your book, is you're trying to break out of the, the sort of dynamics and paradigms that, that men and women have been put into in the modern world. One very quick question before we get into the book, which is you talked a little bit about how you think, and I and this is something on which I completely agree, by the way, the women like you who speak out against certain dogmas that are now widely accepted on whatever mm -hmm. we call this thing that is not the left or whatever, uh, women are more attacked more. They, they mm -hmm. are treated differently to the men. And I see this all the time, right? Uh, why do you think that is? I think there's, there's maybe like a deep psychoanalytic explanation. 
um, which is to do partly with, I think, the idea that women should be caring and kind and maternal and, and you know, any woman who doesn't fulfil that role is somehow some, like, sort of evil witch or harridan and, you know, probably should be burnt. Um, but I actually think a lot of people involved in this act activism are deeply deeply unhappy and they kind of hate their lives and they blame women for having even brought them into the world you know so i think on some level it's a kind of deep hatred of life mm. which then gets projected onto women as the kind of you know somehow responsible for for nature and for life so that's my my deep psychoanalytic <laughs> explanation that these the people um, who are really attacking women kind of hate themselves and i think in some cases actually envy women in another kind of like very creepy and disturbed way. And I think these are the kind of public conversations we need to have um, about how men and women relate to each other in terms of affection and love, but also the complicated aspects in terms of difference and, and possible envy in some mm. cases and things like that. Well, let, let's talk about your book because, you know, it's really, really interesting in some of the stuff you look at. And, and I, I do see, the, see it as an attempt at syn synthesis, mm -hmm. right? You're trying to bring different points of view together. So first of all, where do you think we are as a society when it comes to men and women? And where would you like to see us move to? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think it's always interesting. I think there's something kind of profoundly beautiful and uh, always sort of um, thrilling about the relationship between men and women, um, whether it's between individuals or collectively. Um, and it's always kind of shifting. So I think we live in a very mixed world. I describe it as like a heterosocial world. Mm -hmm. The fact that, you know, work and social life and, and many aspects, if not all aspects of existence in the modern world are basically um, shared. You know, mm -hmm. that men and women do not really have their own domains. There isn't kind of um, any form of, of, of separation, positive or negative. Uh, and that might be an issue. It might be that men and women need to spend more time um, apart <laughs> sometimes, you know, for the for the sake of themselves and also greater harmony. Um, I think obviously I talk about after Me Too, you know, that whether that was a kind of historical, um, you know, whether that was always going to happen at some point, you know, whether there was a sort of uh, necessity, um, but also about the negative aspects of that, like this world of surveillance and technology and how easy it is to kind of sort of defame people and make claims about people. Um, it's very impersonal and inhuman and the kind of technology has sort of separated us in other ways. Um, and so I think we're in a, in a sort of interesting moment. I think there's the possibility of reconciliation, which is what I talk about, forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, I think that men and women generally enjoy spending time together, like whether as partners or friends, although it's often like fraught as well, mm -hmm. like that's the reality. But I think what's being presented in the media or increasingly in the last few years is a very negative story about men. You know, generalizations about men. Um, you could say, well, people always generally generalized about women before, like this is just, you know, correcting the record. But I'm very against this idea of retribution or the mm -hmm. zero sum game. I think this is like this, everyone loses. So all these forms of resentment and, uh, you know, the idea that if men gain, women lose, or if women gain, men lose, I'm very critical of that, that idea. Um, but we've seen all these discussions of like toxic masculinity and, you know, these sort of sweeping claims about basically how all men are evil, you know, and I, I think this is like really, really unhelpful for everybody. And it's simply not true. It doesn't mm. accord with the reality of people's lives. Like the fact that, you know, men and women are friends, the fact that they love each other, the fact that people care about their families, their fathers, their brothers, their sons, and so on. Um, so I really dislike this kind of idea that there's something kind of fundamentally wrong with all kinds of masculinity, which is the sort of liberal story we've been fed in the last few years. It's a great point because the the story that we've been fed is that men are inherently problematic. Yeah. The moment something happens, like that awful case, like the Sarah Everard case, they sort of framed it like men did this. And you're like, no, men didn't do this. It was one man. Can you explain why that's so dangerous to take an extreme case like Sarah Everard and then extrapolate it to be a reflection of all men? Yeah, I mean, I can see the temptation. I can see why people do that. Um, and I think it's, you know, basically what everyone wants to prevent is male violence, mm. right? Like we're all interested in solving this problem. Like men are violent towards each other. They're violent towards themselves. I talk about male suicide in the book. It's a serious problem. Um, and they're violent towards women too, right? So we know that men are responsible for the vast majority of violence. 
The question is, how do we prevent this? You know, I don't think that demonising all men and saying that they're evil is going to help. I think that's actually going to encourage uh, in a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy sort of way, um, particularly when men are seriously alienated um, and atomised. And I talk about incels and, um, you know, in a way, try to explain or understand or sympathise with their plight, if you see what I mean. Again, these are these are groups of men who are you're allowed to hate, you know. Um, with, the, with these very, very extreme, violent, horrific cases, right? We, of course, we have to recognise that's what they are. Um, they are rare. Um, they are something we absolutely want to prevent at all costs. Um, one of my suggestions in the book is that men do need to think of themselves as a, as a class. You know, I think women are very used to being treated as like examples of a class, like mm. this kind of woman or, you know, that, that women in a way, either because of, I don't know, for social, cultural or other reasons, um, often feel like they're members of a class or they're often positioned in that way, in a way that men are often not necessarily. Like men uh, maybe think of themselves as individuals first and men second or something like this. And that's fair enough. I mean, we're all individuals too. Um, <laughs> um, but so, so I'm very interested in those kind of mechanisms of like mentorship and how men can, if you like, um, deal with other men when they when they start acting in ways that were that are problematic, right? Mm -hmm. So the the man who killed Sarah Everard um, had a reputation, right? Other pe other men in the police force gave him names like the rapist, right? They knew that there was something wrong with this guy, um, and they didn't prevent it because they didn't kind of step in and deal with it, right? If you see what I mean. Like if, if there was a more self-conscious way of thinking this man makes the rest of us look bad or might make the rest of us look bad, then there might be better ways of kind of preventing these kind of horrific um, acts, if you see what I mean. Um, so it's a really complicated question, but I think it, in the first place, it's like saying men are good and men can be good. And this is not something that we're generally used to hearing in the past few years. So there has to be like positive uh, masculinity, you know, so that men can improve, like women too, right? We can all be better. You know, this is a, not only a Christian idea, it's a, you know, an idea we should all kind of, I don't know, um, hope for, right? Rather than think that we're kind of doomed and that, you know, men are inherently bad or something like this. So yeah, so I think, I do think men do need to look out for each other more. And this is part of what patriarchy and responsibility is, actually. You know, patriarchy is not um, stealing things and telling people what to do. It's actually taking responsibility in a profoundly deep and human way, whether it's for children, whether it's for other men, whether it's for women. Do you have a website or do you plan to have a website? Well, if you do, then Easy DNS are the company for you. Easy DNS is the perfect domain name registrar provider and web host for you. They have a track record of standing up for their clients, whether it be cancel culture, de-platform attacks, or overzealous government agencies. He knows a bit about that. So will you in a second. Easy DNS have rock solid network infrastructure and incredible customer support. They're in your corner, no matter what the world throws at you, unless it's your ex-girlfriend, in which case you're on your own. You'd know about that. <laughs> Move your domains and websites over to EasyDNS right now. All you've got to do is head over to easydns.com forward slash triggered and use our promo code, which is of course triggered as well, and you will get 50% off the initial purchase. Sign up for their newsletter, Access of Easy, that tells you everything you need to know about technology, privacy, and censorship. When you see you know, men being demonized and you, and you see, you know, people saying these things on social media, a lot of the time it comes from, from women and you think, but hang on a second, you have a father, you must have brothers, friends, whatever else. The vast majority of them will be straight women who at the end of it will want a relationship. Can you not see that that is not helping us come together? That's not actually helping society become more cohesive. You're just being divisive. Yeah. And I think it cuts both ways. You know, there are some men I talk about in the book who see in, in all women, you know, or they, they let's say they have a bad experience with one woman and then they kind of generalise like all women are bitches or whatever, mm. you know, and I think so we, you know, the difference might... is, Nina, I'm very sorry to interrupt is and this is not like defending that point of view at all because yeah. I hate men like that. But 
that they are a tiny minority no, no, and they don't get say. column inches, right? You don't get to have a, an yeah, article yeah. in The Guardian every week talking about how women are bitches. No, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would make for great, well, that great would be content. Well, that form of equality. Yeah. 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 Do, do, do you know what I mean, though? No, no, like, that's of, the difference. Of, like, absolutely, of course. So what I was going to say is, like, you know, you have a snor- small number of men who might say that, a small number of women who say generalise about men right. in the same way, right? Mm. But, uh, but what it, one of the things I say is that, like, misogyny, true misogyny is actually really rare, you know, just mm. as misandry is actually really rare, yeah. because in practice, women m- largely spend time with men, they feel safe with them, they trust them, they love them, and so on. So, you know, again, it's this kind of like getting away from this resentment mm. um, and this zero sum game idea is like, how can we live better together, you know, and acknowledge harm where it's necessary to do so, but not make these kind of systematic generalizations about all men or all mm. women. You know, and I think Me Too in some ways was this kind of really unfortunate, one of the aspects of it that was really bad. It, it People were allowed to sort of retcon previous relationships, mm. right? Probably all of us have had bad relationships where it wasn't particularly anyone's fault. It was just, you know, or it ended badly or, you know, mm. both people behaved stupidly or whatever, you know. And But some people wanted to then go back, cause particularly some women wanted to go back and say, you know, that guy was, a, was an abuser or that mm. guy was like, you know, evil right because that whole victim narrative allows you to do that it allows you to see the world in black and white but it's not right we're all kind of capable of harm we're all good and bad we're all a mixture of these things men and women included and if we position women as pure victims then we're basically putting them back in the position of being children right which is not what women want either right you know there's something kind of awful about that so women do have power right women do have meaning and agency and they they can make choices and, and all of those things um and they can also be very um cruel to men you know they can destroy men's lives if they want to you know so i think we have to acknowledge that both men and women have power they have different kinds of power mm. right but what it means to be an adult is actually n- navigating and negotiating those things in all of their complexity and it's too simple to say you know either this group of people is good or this people of group group is bad you know it doesn't work like that well, the last question before you jump in, Constantine, is how much of this do you think is based on the desire for vengeance? I mean, and it's a particularly loaded question. I, I remember with me too, seeing what happened when people were talking about it. And understandably, there, there was anger and there was rage. But there was also this very unpleasant undercurrent of wanting to tear men down that I found really uncomfortable. And it's why... I never really got behind the whole Me Too thing because I knew where it was going to end up. I could see what was happening. I knew what the end game was. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, like psychoanalytically as a society, we haven't really confronted these things like the desire for revenge or envy or lust or, you know, these things are really hard to deal with, you know, and, and often these things are kind of like cover stories or eruptions for a deeper conversation. And I think... Well, one thing that's really important would be to sort of have a more psychoanalytic discourse in general, you know, and not pretend that we're somehow past all that just because we've got mobile phones, you know. And one of the aspects of the book is like going back to previous things that our ancestors did and thought as if, you know, I I hate this idea that we're modern and that we there's nothing for us to learn from previous ways of thinking or from previous ways of behaving. I mean, there's loads of stuff to learn. In fact, people maybe had better solutions, you know? You see these sort of young women on TikTok, for example, going like, oh, you know, oh, maybe we should get men to stay around if they, you know, if we have a child a child with them and, you know, they should take some responsibility. And it's like, you've just reinvented marriage, you know? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and this is happening all the time. It's like, there were previous solutions to some of the same questions. Um, but yeah, I think I think maybe, there are different ways of acknowledging these sorts of deep currents. Like the Greeks had myth and gods and, you know, there's a way of kind of dealing culturally with psychoanalytically describable emotions that don't go away, you know, just because we're online, you know. So I think we probably need a better culture in a way that deals with, or a culture that basically acknowledges more explicitly these complex feelings so it doesn't turn into a kind of vengeance spiral. Mm. Yeah, yeah, because we do act like every activist is motivated purely by the desire to improve things. When <laughs> right. having met activists, mm. yeah, there's a lot of ego weird stuff going on. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot. Of, there's ego. There's revenge. There's bitterness. There's resentment. There's personal trauma that's then yeah. built on to make the whole world seem like it's that thing. 
Do you think one of the reasons that we are sort of talking about this stuff now increasingly, and you know, one of the reasons I think for the explosion in Jordan Peterson's mm -hmm. popularity was the fact that maybe it's this narrative or maybe it's other things, you, you tell me what you think, but we've kind of got to a position over time where, as Francis talks about, we've demonized men and this, we've said they're bad, but we've also created increasingly generations of men who are not living up to that standard of patriarchy, the positive vision of patriarchy you described. Increasingly, you see young men taking less responsibility, mm -hmm. increasingly not hanging around when they've had a child with someone, you know, abrogating other things that men traditionally are supposed supposed to yeah. do in inverted commas. Uh, so at the same time as telling men they're bad, we're also seeing men actually not behave like men much anymore. Yeah, so I do discuss um, Peterson's popularity in the book and. You know, I think it's really symptomatic. I think it speaks to a need or a desire for a sort of father figure in the first place. You know, like there's something extremely patrician about Peterson. He dresses in a kind of 1950s dad sort of way, <laughs> you know, and he's sort of literally telling people to clean their room and stand up straight and all the things that you would associate with a sort of, um, you know, father figure. And mm. and I think his popularity has to partly be diagnosed in that way, that he's providing something which isn't there in the broader culture, amongst other things. Um, and actually, I, I say that this is good for women. Peterson is actually good for women just because one thing he says to young men in particular, but not only, but let's stick with the young men, is you need to take responsibility for your own life and not blame women for your situation. And the implication is also like if you sort yourself out, then you might stand more of a chance basically of, you know, being attractive to others, getting a job and, and you know, functioning in the world. And actually that takes the pressure off in that sense. You know, the, the idea that men deserve a woman or it's women's job to tidy up after men or something like that. You know, Peterson's against that. You know, so I think, it, you know, whatever he says about women, who cares? Women are chaos, great, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, He's not wrong I don't either, mind. come on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind, that's all fine. But actually I do think on balance, I, he's actually very positive in that sense. Yeah, because, I agree. You know, and, the, and it's it, the stoic virtues, you know, like, there's so much stoicism in the kind of masculinist literature, you know, and I think it's really interesting. It's very, very um, symptomatic and significant, I think. Well, it's the only thing that works for men. This is why, you know, you say for, you know, you, you empathize with incels. I empathize with them less, actually, but I don't hate them. <laughs> yeah. I just think they haven't got the piece that, that, that helps make your life better, which is as a man, you've only got really one route. You work hard, you improve your skill set, you get better, you make more money, you raise your status in society. And then all the stuff that you currently not getting because evil women haven't let you have it <laughs> is going to happen. Yeah. Right? But for a man, the route to that lies through taking responsibility, upping your game. That's it for a man, right? You've got to up your game and that's it. So being stuck in a community of other people who encourage you to stay where you are, that's my issue with that movement only. Mm. I, I, I empathize with with that. Yeah, I mean, there's a strong class dimension too, which mm. is um, in Alex Lee Moya made a very interesting documentary. I don't know if you've seen it, um, TFW, No GF, That Feeling When No Girlfriend, where mm. she she interviews um, some incels who are like big on um, online and or people associated with the movement. And, you know, this is really a, a story about class. Like these are often young men living in extraordinarily depressed and dispossessed areas mm. who mm. actually, yes, are trying to improve their lives through working out, through, you know, laughing with their friends online and so on. But it's really, really difficult, right? When there's no jobs, there's like no hope, you're stuck in mm. your, you know, the basement of your mother's house and use a cliche, but you know, that is a reality for millions of mm. people. And it's mm. like, I mean, I don't disagree with you that people have to take personal responsibility. Um, and I think one of the problems with a certain leftist or fake leftist discourse is the idea that you can just blame the structures you know, that, that you have no moral or individual agency or that anyone who talks about individuals must be right wing. It's like, no, actually, you know, you can't keep blaming society for your problems. You yeah. Know. The reason I feel comfortable saying it, because it sounds a little bit judgmental, but look, when I was 18, I was sleeping in a park, mm. right? So if I can sleep in a park and then still make something of myself, I, I'm not saying every single person is the same or everyone should be like me or anything like that, but if you find yourself in a difficult position, all I'm saying is, I'm not saying you will necessarily succeed. I'm just saying the only way out for a man is that. Yeah, there is no other way. I mean, and to put it back in the context of a community or relations, it's like if you sort yourself out, I mean, I've had issues. I, I had a massive midlife crisis. I was like told 
totally messed up, mm -hmm. right? And I sorted myself out, you know, and I think a lot of people have this experience at some point, right? And it's possible and it's amazing that it's possible. And I think the thing is like, once you realize that it's possible to take hold of your own life, it's actually better for everyone else as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not selfish to look after yourself. Mm -hmm. It's actually better for everyone, right. you know, because then you can help other people if they, they're in trouble, you know, it becomes this kind of, um, outward looking thing, you know, it's a proper social gesture, you know, it's actually much kinder and more empathetic and thoughtful um, to, to not be selfish, not be a, you know, self-indulgent prick, you know. But isn't the problem... Strong message there. Yeah. <laughs> it's the title of the episode. Don't, don't be, be a selfish, selfish entitled prick. <laughs> yeah, but isn't part of the problem that the world that we're living in is more and more feminized? It's celebrating more and more female values, you know, the traditional male values, the traditional male jobs are dwindling. So the problem is for men, they're not really getting a chance to be masculine, to celebrate these masculine virtues. And as a result, they're not progressing in the same way. Yeah, I think it's a, this is a really um, important question. And I think it's one, again, that we all have to collectively work out, mm -hmm. right, in the, in the coming years. Um, and there's been lots of interesting articles and pieces about the kind of feminization. Like I wrote a book in 2009, which was about feminization of work. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and it was an explicitly political discussion, uh, d decision, right? So like under Thatcher, it was like, we are no longer going to be this industrial nation. We're mm -hmm. going to move towards the knowledge economy. This will privilege typically feminine skills like, you know, communication and mediation mm -hmm. and, and words and whatnot. Um, and yes, I think that's absolutely happened, right? So we live in an increasingly feminized world, however we want to see that. Um, and it is a problem, right? There's this kind of um, excess of male energy and, and you know, all of the ways in which that would have been expressed through physical labor. I mean, those jobs still exist, right? It's not that they're not completely disappeared, but you're right as a tendency, you know, it's like, I don't know, if you go to kind of depressed, like um, post-industrial places, a lot of men are working out in the gym but they're not like working, they're not building things or making things, you know, and I'm, I'm pro people going to the gym, obviously, but it's, it's no replacement, if you like, for actually participating, having a social role, you know, and I think this is one of the things that leads to the, you know, sort of high rates of male suicide and drug use and self harm, you know, because it's this lack of a social role, you know, and I don't really have the solution. It's like, you know, we might need to decide how to live together differently in the future and what we do with all of our different skills and energies. But it has to be a collective decision. And I think both men and women, of course, and children have a stake in this. Mm. Um, it, it, it's a vicious circle. We, um, we had to, Dr. Tony Sewell on and the, and the first interview we did with him, he made such a profound point. Remember, if you're a boy, you're gonna have, you're likely to have mum at home, her friends, then you go into school, you're going to have a female teacher in a, the whole environment. You, hard, you, you hardly see a man. Let me give you a, something that's really interesting. You can go to some, of the, some primary schools now, and I, it's happened to me on a number of occasions. You go into the primary school and suddenly all these little boys start running up, running up towards you. It's, it's, quite, it's quite scary. It's almost like you're Santa Claus. You go in yes. there <laughs> and, go, and it's like, oh man, I've never seen a man. Yeah. And they, no. they, think that, that they secretly think you're going to be their teacher. That's it. But they're disappointing because yeah. <laughs> you're just visiting, you know. Yeah. And, they, and they go, they're running up to you and they, they're talking to you. They kind of, because if you sit down with some of those boys, they actually do not have any interaction with any um, male uh, adult authority. Yeah, that's right. None. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I do talk in the book about the ne you know, necessity for ritual and mm. mentorship and all of these things that are kind of missing in our culture. You know, I do, I do think, you know, children need both male and female influence. They absolutely do. Mm. You know, girls as well. Um, you know, and of course, like we want to celebrate alternative family arrangements and so on. But at the same time, there's a general social responsibility. And I think um, absolutely... Um, I was speaking to someone today who was saying that there's an uh, Australian researcher who said that young boys need to fight with older men, like wrestle with them, so mm -hmm. that the older man can tell them when to stop, if you see what I mean, mm -hmm. so that you learn yeah. your limits um, and, you know, what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate in terms of your use of physical strength. You know, and if you're not getting that, um, then the violence might go elsewhere, which is, again, what we want to deal with, what we want to confront and um, prevent, you know. So, yeah, really 
there is kind of how to direct all of that energy. It's not being done well. And I think there is a suspicion of men in mentorship roles. Sometimes that's correct. I think we also need to give back power to female intuition, by the way. So when women say there's something not right here with a man, like you, like men have got to listen as well. So I think, you know, and, and they've also got to trust their own instincts. And, and what I said before about men looking out and looking after each other, I think, rather than seeing themselves as this kind of um, first person shooter individual, you know, it's got to be a kind of um, horizontal relation to, to masculinity and to other men as well. So I think we all need to, yeah, participate in this kind of, um, I don't know, more harmonious and um, expansive uh, relation that has more male and female influences. And also older people as well, like the way in which we treat older people as if they're kind of irrelevant, you know. I think this cutting off of the older generation, um, you know, from grandchildren and from their children is also like, you know, awful. It's, it tells you something terrible about our culture. What you're talking about, I think, is the atomization of society yeah. just generally. It's like we, the, the size of the family shrinks, the number of connections people have shrinks outside of their phone, etc. It there's so many things you're bringing up. So how do we get to the sunny uplands of tomorrow where we're all living in perfect harmony? <laughs> I don't know about perfect harmony, but I think just a kind of more honest discussion, you know, mm. in general, like not demonizing one sex or the other, taking responsibility for ourselves and each other. Um, I mean, acknowledging harm where it exists, you know, and that's important, but also not thinking of ourselves as kind of, wholly good or wholly bad even, you know, both are extreme positions that are largely not true, you know, for anybody. Um, Do you think we'll ever get past, I mean, you are not the first person to have said this word sitting in that chair. We had Julie Bindle on a few weeks ago and she talked about, and I think it's inevitably a fact that all of this conversation, as you've said earlier, is about dealing with the fact that men are violent, mm -hmm. right? Do you think we'll ever get past the biological reality that men are what they are and women are different and there's a size difference, there's a strength difference, there's there's a brain difference. Men, men are violent for a reason, right? Young men seek status and, 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 and in the process of doing that, that's when that happens. Sure. I mean, we're animals with a thin veneer of poetry, right? you know, so, and, and men and women are different. I mean, this is like, I make this point. <gasps> I, know. <laughs> I know. Now I can see why they're trying to cancel you, Nina. <laughs> I know. So my opening line is like, men and women exist. You know, this is my controversial <laughs> opening statement. Um, no, and it's, it's really important to recognize where that difference is relevant, whether mm. it's biologically in law, in sports, you know, in separate spaces and so on, right? A lot of, you know, discussions about this in recent years you know but they are but we are different and the difference i i want to say is beautiful like it's cosmic you know yeah. it's a metaphysical difference um and it's it's what makes life worth worth living in many ways and i you know i do discuss separatism that's one possibility but i don't think that's the solution it's certainly not the solution for most people who will have a relationship of one kind um either friendship or you know at work or whatever or a, or a romantic relationship um so it's I don't know how to, how to put it, like the, to recognise the capacity of men in particular towards violence is there are ways of channeling it, like through sport, through um, activity, through kind of, um, I don't know, ritual and, and if we recognise it rather than, I don't know, just sort of um, pretend that men can somehow be completely different and change. It's like to recognise that reality and to channel it in more positive and beautiful ways, mm -hmm. you know. I, that's the only way. The, 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 yeah, completely agree. That is the only way. Hey, Constantine, do you love trigonometry? Of course. Incredible interviews, hilarious live streams, hard hitting satire, plus my handsome jawline. Whatever takes away from your hairline. But if you do love trigonometry and you want to support us, there's only one place to do that and that's on Locals. Yes, Locals is a brilliant platform that has been incredibly supportive to our show and other problematic creators. The great thing about Locals is that it's a community for people who love trigonometry. That's right, it's a place for you to hang out with like-minded people, share thoughts, memes, and discuss the show. You can enjoy it for free 
but it also gives you the option of supporting us for as little as $7 a month. And if you want to give more, you can. We have incredible rewards for our higher tier supporters as well. We've got everything from mugs, monthly group calls, and one-on-two -on -two chats with me and KK. Get in. Join our community by hitting the link in the description and the pinned comment below. See you there, guys. There is the other part of it where there is always, unfortunately, going to be a small minority of men who are sexually violent. And I see, some, I see these posts go up all the time after, for instance, Sarah Everard, but also other awful, awful cases. The, the last one was, was, the, was the awful case of that primary school teacher who was murdered. And you, and you see women write, you know, why is it that I have to walk down the streets and be scared of men and always looking over my shoulder? And I think to myself, there's a really small part of me that thinks to myself, unfortunately, there's always going to be that small, very small percentage of men who do that. And they're always going to have a disproportionate effect on society, isn't there? Well, I mean, there are different ways, I think, of, of, of preventing... I don't know how to put it. It's not on women to change their behaviour, I would say. I completely it's, agree. You know, and we live in, you know, particular ways. Women have particular freedoms. I don't think people would want to go um, towards a, a, a more segregated or domestic public private split in which women stay at home or they need a chaperone or whatever. You know, I don't think that's what um, anybody wants. Um, if they do want that, they can move somewhere else. Um, <laughs> So, but so, it's not about, sorry to interrupt yeah. just on that point, because this is, you know, Francis says, I completely agree. I don't completely agree. I agree that women should have the freedom to do what they want or everyone should. I also don't agree that you're going to get to a place where a man and a woman can walk down the same street at the same time of night and be equally safe. No, it's I, not going to happen. No. Right. And if that is true, that means that, yes, unfortunately, as a society, we have to be honest and say that is never going to happen because there's a biological difference between men and women and because men want from women what they don't want from other men, by and large, right, in that sort of environment. And so we're going to have to, you know, yes, we're going to do everything we can to civilize men, and that's an important part of education and upbringing and whatever. There's also a part of civilizing women in the sense of going like, look, you're living in society and some people in society are evil and you need to protect yourself. And that may mean that you don't walk around at 3 a.m., even though I can. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's probably the current situation they're in. I mean, I do think there are ways of kind of... Um, we condition ourselves, right? So I'm I'm very against the widespread availability of pornography, right? Mm. I, th I think it's extremely detrimental to men in particular. I think it changes people's brain chemistry. It does terrible things to their thoughts. I think it kind of destroys imagination. I think it kind of... Um, um, coarsens and erodes our capacity to be playful and and lighthearted actually and I, I think you know it those sort of images are, are are horrific you know I think they generate a vision of the world which is um, you know very dangerous actually and so I side with the kind of anti-pornography feminism increasingly you know and it's it for me it's it's complicated because you know I, I also want to defend experimental cinema and freedom of expression and you know um, but we, I think we have to look at the material reality. And, it, and if it turns out, which I think it does, that pornography is detrimental to the way in which people behave in the world, mm. particularly men, um, then we might want to have a question about whether it's great to have what, such widespread availability of hardcore pornography, mm. particularly for younger people. You know, it's so that would be one question. You know, we, the other side of it might be something about how do we change our virtues and our morals and how do we behave in a more civilised way um, such that, maybe we, we we do go backwards in a certain sense, like towards traditions or uh, modes of social um, interaction that are more formalised, you know, so that we don't end up having like um, a million hookups that are meaningless or something like this, you know. But is that really what the end game of liberalism is? Like the freedom to treat everyone like a commodity? You know, I mean, <laughs> this is like really disturbing, you know, and that way we destroy everything that's like specific about ourselves. You know, and we are these like, you know, I don't know, beautiful individual people, you know, but by treating everyone the same, by treating them as someone to consume, we kind of destroy that specialness. Yeah, I see what you're saying. But come back to my point about yeah. safety on the street, because I do think like the, uh, the reason I'm bringing it up is I know it's super controversial and I'm interested in super controversial things. And I was just putting an argument to you, but to maybe give you a better example, 
Sophie, our video editor who works with us, you know, she used to come to our, our previous studio, which was not in a nice area. And every time she stayed late, we'd either get her a taxi, which we wouldn't do for a guy, or one or several of us would walk her to the tube station. And she always really appreciated both yeah. of those things. But there's there's also an argument which is sometimes being made when these conversations are brought up, which is like, well, a woman shouldn't have to be protected or a woman shouldn't have to take a taxi. And no, in principle, I agree. I just don't know, given the sex differences and male violence and all of that that we've talked about, that you're ever going to get to a place where I would teach my daughter, oh, you can just walk around any time, you'd be fine. And there's no fucking way I'm teaching my daughter that. Yeah, no, no. Because sure. that's irresponsible parenting, if you ask me, mm -hmm. right? Now, some of the feminist movement would say, well, that's accepting the, the blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, I am accepting the reality. I don't want my daughter to put herself in positions where she's going to be assaulted. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, from a from a realistic, reasonable standpoint, yeah. yeah I mean, this is how we behave, right? You know, we we look after people, um, particularly women. You know, like women are free to go and get drunk and get high, right? Mm. That you would look after somebody who is in that state. You might look after a woman more than you might look after a man, mm. right? There are differences. Right. There are physical differences. Mm. There are differences in levels of desire. Some men are not going to um, adhere to the social rules. I agree with you. I, I think in this world, as it currently exists, it makes sense to protect women more in certain situations. Mm. But Nina, don't you think that it's always going to be like that? That's what I mean. There's always going to be that percentage right. of awful people, of, all, of awful men. There's always <laughs> going to be abusers. There's always yeah. going to be rapists. Unfortunately, right, man, you're advocating very hard <laughs> on their behalf here. <laughs> the, the accent doesn't help. I realise that. <laughs> and that's unfortunately going to be a constant through society. These crimes have always just as like, there's always going to be murderers. Just... So these crimes have always existed and they will always continue to exist as far as humanity goes. Well, how do you think men should deal with that question? With, with what question specifically? Well, with this kind of inevitability of male violence and... Of the inevitability of male violence, it's by men protecting women. Right. To, so they ensure that they're not walking around... So, for instance, you know... <laughs> You've ended that sentence on a very bad note, yeah, mate. You know, yeah. To ensure they're not walking around. Just, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just stay just home where you making belong. Making sure you stay... No. <laughs> to make sure that they're not walking around uh, at night, uh, you know, two o'clock in the morning, to ensure that if you're in a dodgy area that they're going to be taking a cab, etc., etc. A bit of common sense. And whilst the utopian in me would, would wants to get to that point, there's a realist in me that goes, these crimes have always existed, they will always continue to exist. We have to protect women from a very small percentage of men. And also to your earlier point, if I may answer the mm. same question as well, about the guy who murdered Sarah Everard and who had a reputation. The problem is, I've never been in that position where I, I, I thought, oh, this person I'm working with is a massive rapist. Like, but You've worked in the comedy industry, mate. That's true. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, good point. I, I take that back. I've worked in an industry where almost everyone. No, um, but my point is, what are you supposed to do in that situation as a man beyond protecting the women who may in the immediate mm. environment be affected and going, look, stay away from this guy or, you know, keeping him away from them or whatever. But beyond that, what is a man supposed to do? You can't report someone because you think they might be a bit dodgy. And we don't live in that society, right? Yet. Uh, yeah. W like, what are you... Do you see what I'm saying? I, I, I don't think every problem in life is solvable in that way. No, I mean, I, again, I think it's really like a very complicated question. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm not here to say how men should deal with other men. Mm -hmm. I just think that they should think about it, yeah. you know, and work it out. You know, I think there might be forms of uh, male violence that might be necessary, actually, between men, you know. Um, Absolutely. Or something like this. Or the threat of it. The threat yeah. of yeah. it. This is what I've always said this. The threat of violence is a really important behavior modulator for men. The yeah. fact that if I behave in a certain way, I'm going to get punched in the face really affects how I behave. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, it's not up to women. And I, you know, I, I agree. It would be lovely to live in a utopian world in which we didn't have to worry about these things. I think it is, is always potentially a problem. The, the trip would be to minimize it to kind mm. of, yeah. I mean, I think we have to be realistic. I don't know if my book is tough enough on men in some ways, right? I think the darkness of some aspects of male desire um, is something that maybe men need to talk about more, you know? Like, 
what is it like to be part of a class um, that has these members in it for you? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, can you put yourself in the mindset of a rapist or a murderer? No, because it, we interviewed Luke Gittos, who is a, who is a lawyer who deals with a lot of these particular a lot of these particular crimes, and he says that actually he made the point that rape isn't about sex; it's about violence; it's about control. So no, I I I could never do that. But I unfortunately acknowledge that these men do exist, and that is a darkness to male sexuality. But I don't see myself as part of a class, Nina. This is the thing. It's like, I don't think that just because someone has a penis and I have a penis, we're like the same thing. I, I treat people based on what they think and how they behave. And there are women and men who are like that. And there's also women and men who I just think are completely alien to me. So I don't see myself as part of the same class. But a class has differences within it, right? I mean, if we want to say that sex is real, sex yeah. exists, you know, there are men and there are women, right? Yeah. And okay, to, to the degree in which you identify with that class is is kind of up to you. Yeah. Um, but you are a man. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I checked. Yeah. Uh, no, I am a man. But why does I? What I don't understand about that way of thinking is why does the behavior of a tiny minority of men who are different to me in every way reflect on me? Well, I mean. If we like all... there are women who behave in ways that you would disagree with completely, think are abhorrent, and you criticize openly. Is their behavior reflective on you because you're both women? No, but I think there is a way in which, I don't know, maybe this is part of sexual difference. Maybe women do identify with other women, actually, in mm. ways that men mm. don't identify with other men. I think that's probably And true. I think it's probably not just because women are often treated as a class and women are treated as examples of their mm. class, mm. right? I mean, this is de Beauvoir's point in the second sex. You know, m women are, in a way, more often treated as members of a sex in relation to men. Um, and in relation to each other. Whereas men, in a way, get to be individuals first and foremost. So you can say, I don't relate to these men. I can't understand these men who do these terrible things. I nevertheless admit that they exist and they'll never go away or, you know. Um, so I don't know. I mean, this is maybe the provocation. It's like, as an imaginative exercise, you know, to think about what it is to be a member of a class with people who mm. you who do things that you find absolutely abhorrent and can't... But to know, me, their behavior rules out their membership of my tribe. So they're not men? No, it's, it's because my tribe is not men. My tribe is people who behave and think in particular ways. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them will be men. But I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, the difference between me and you is far smaller than the difference between me and Ian Huntley. Far smaller, the difference between you and I. Far smaller. I can imagine some of the ways of being the way that you are. I can't imagine being in Huntley. Mm -hmm. So that's that's why I'm saying what I'm saying. Sure. Do you, see, do you see what? So to me, the maleness of that situation is completely, to me, they're a class of their own, people who behave in that way. And 99.999% of men that I know would never in a million years behave in that way or even contemplate it. Yeah, exactly. And I think we have to like be very... Um make this point. Most men don't do these terrible things, mm. right? This is why it's stupid to generalize about men and say that all masculinity is evil and right. so on, right? That's but you the, asked about how do I feel being yeah. part of that class? That's what I'm answering. No, 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 absolutely. So I think, you know, it's, it's really, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a kind of deeper question about the problem of evil, but we mm. <laughs> you need a the more theologians on your show. But, um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it, evil is ineradicable. You know, we live in a fallen world. You know, <laughs> Satan is the, the prince of this world. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, we do live in that way. And I, so, OK, another preventative way of thinking about it might be how do we stop these small number of men thinking that it's OK to behave in this way or to treat women in this way, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, is it that they, dis, they disrespect women? Is it that they were taught not to, to kind of... Um, uh, treat people in a certain way like what's going on with that like why I don't know how is it possible for them to even be in this position that they think it's okay mm -hmm. to behave in this way right do you not think that that is a brain thing like these people are sociopathic their brain works differently um, because maybe. of childhood trauma because of genetics potentially because all of us carry rapist DNA in us by the way right 
every single human being on earth. So some, I mean, I, I'm not saying every single person who's ever committed sexual violence is like that, but a lot of the people, particularly with the more heinous stuff, I think, uh, I just think their brain works differently. And there's been a lot of evidence. Like if you look at psychopaths in prison, there's been a lot of studies that show they don't respond to the same incentive structures as, as quote unquote normal people. Mm -hmm. So the reason that they do what they do is they feel entitled to have what they want to have and they don't care about other people. That is the definition of sociopathy. Yeah. Right. So th this is what I find so incredibly, I was going to say offensive, just stupid about the narrative about this issue is like, you're not going to educate these people to respect women. <laughs> this is not an issue of respect for women. These people don't give a shit about any other human being on earth. They care about fulfilling their desires, right? And it is every man's desire to have sex with a woman, right? So they're going to do it. That's it. And so I don't think you're, it's not an educational issue. No, okay, but uh, let's say those people who aren't sociopaths, yeah. right? There, there, mm. there's a range of behaviour, yeah. and a lot of the stuff we're talking about actually is grey area stuff. Right. You know, mm. when people make a mistake or they overstep a mark. I mean, a lot of um, things that are often treated as very distinctive forms of um, behaviour are actually much more complicated. You know, mm. they are people making a mistake or being drunk and behaving inappropriately, as we all have at some point, right? Mm. Let's let's be clear. So when we're talking about sociopathy, I think. Right, it's a very, it's extremely difficult, right? How do we treat people who in some ways we don't regard as human in a way that doesn't itself fall into the trap of inhumanity, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's kind of almost unanswerable. You know, you could basically say, like, let's try and identify who these sociopaths are before they do sociopathic things. Mm -hmm. I've seen that minority <laughs> report, it's a good movie. Right, <laughs> <laughs> it might be possible, like, yeah. let's you know, pre-crime. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, we need to talk about Kevin, the Lionel Shriver book is, is, is sort of about this. It's like, you know, there, there are ways that I'm sure people are working on, you know, how do you identify? It, it seems like sociopaths often have a trajectory, like they, when they're children, they kill animals yes. or whatever, yeah. you know, yes. I, I don't know enough about it, but it's, it, you know, what if there was a way of saying, look, these, there's something sort of wrong from the standpoint of our, you know, normal empathetic humanity mm -hmm. with these people. We shouldn't treat them inhumanely, but maybe there's a way of dealing with this with this question, you know. And we know, for example, that it seems like some sociopathy is quite useful. Like if you're a brain surgeon mm -hmm. or a pilot and you you need not to have adrenaline, you need not to be squeamish, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you don't want someone freaking out in those situations, right? Right or empathizing with the brain in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you know, you might say, well, lots of our leaders are sociopathic. They behave in ways that are completely uh, inhumane and- uh, And look how great everything is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, exactly. So, I mean, again, <laughs> collectively, you yeah. know, it, it's because we live in such a fragmented, atomized way. If we, li you know, it's the same with the women walking home at night. If you live somewhere where you knew everybody yeah. and everybody's safety was part of a kind of common project or everyone was looking mm. out for each other and you knew who everyone was, mm. it would be a different story. You know, you might be able to identify the person who is like potentially dangerous and, and deal with it. Or, you know, I don't know, the village elders might be able to sort of say you're behaving terribly or mm. I don't know, like, OK, that's naive, but there are different ways of imagining a social life which would minimize harm but also not end up in this kind of like pathological pod world where everyone is just on their internet because they're scared of going outside which is what's been encouraged in the last two years mm -hmm. you know so there is a kind of like to be alive is to to risk right you know it's it's um life doesn't really mean anything if it's just safety and comfort you know and you never take any uh risks at all like that's just not living but And that's what incels do, that's what a lot of men are doing, and it's such a profound point, because they're retreating. Mm -hmm. They retreat into the world of internet, you know, forums or whatever else, or video games. But what, what is a video game but a chance for you to be able to achieve? Mm -hmm. And that must be so tempting for, uh, you know, a, a young man who doesn't feel that he has opportunities open to him, for whatever reason, he can go into this make-believe world and become something. It's also a very linear reward structure as well, which yeah. makes video games. Like I play video games and enjoy them. The, the thing with a video game that's very different to life is, in a video game, if you work hard, you will instantly be rewarded. Like if you do the right things, you'll be rewarded. In life, you might have, to, you will be rewarded, but maybe 20 years from now, mm. if you do the right thing. And you might even be initially punished quite badly 
as, sure. you, as you found in your own experience. <laughs> so that's the yeah, difference. Sure. As well. I mean, yeah, I mean, these are bigger questions about the relationship between the real and the virtual and the kind of mm. world we're heading towards. Right. Mm. I mean, my book is is very critical of technology. It's it hates it. You know, it's basically like we need to be together. We need to have real experiences, real life. You know, I there's a horrible image of the world which says, uh, you know, in the near future, only the elites will be able to have real experiences, mm. real sex, real food, real mm. encounters, real conversations. And everyone else will be like, fucking, you know, wired up to these sorts of things, right? Mm. And this is terrible, right? We need to break with this thing that's coming, you know, and that will involve men and women talking to each other and, you know, being in risky situations. I mean, even the dating stuff, it's like the idea that you can get the algorithm to choose your date for you rather than have a conversation with a stranger in a bar. Like the idea of a man going up to a woman now is like in, in work or in a bar is like really frowned upon, you know, but that was the reality. Like when I was growing up, you just go to the pub and get drunk and get off with someone, you know, you wouldn't like check out their feelings about the death penalty. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's also as well, you see these hashtags like never date a Tory. Right. And and you just go, what? You don't want to talk to people who are different to you. Exactly. But no one does anymore, right? But that's where the magic happens. To go, I think you're wrong. What happened to a bit of sexual tension? Well, I didn't know you felt that way about me, mate. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I don't want things to be mediated in this this way. So how do it's we get awful. to the sunny uplands, Nina? This is what I want to hear from you. How, how do we how do I, we heal all this? Because one of the <laughs> points you made, actually, I yeah. totally agree with. Like, my wife has, like, a card she can pull out at any time. If she says... My intuition tells me that we shouldn't do this. Like, it doesn't matter what it is. I'll just go, cool. Yeah. And I'll accept it without argument because she's been proven right on a hell of a lot of stuff in the past. So intuition, I think, is a huge part of this, actually. And intuitively, men and women know a lot more about the, the right way to behave with each other than what we're being told by society or whatever right now. Do you know what I mean? So that's yeah. part of it. What else? How do we get to this beautiful place in the future? I don't know. I don't think, I mean, my book is optimistic. It's not delusional. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like it's, there is no like utopia. All right, we're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it's, it's, I think it's all of these more delicate things. You know, it is like playful conversation. Mm. It is acknowledging the reality that we do have a whole series of, you know, ambivalent and interesting relationships with each other. We have male and female friends, you know, it, that these are not always overdetermined by by sex or by you know that that actually we live in a much more sort of complicated network you know if we're lucky to have different social interactions and I think yeah to be in a position where those things are real and possible you know so that there is more conversation there isn't this kind of um, pushing people to the periphery and the outside and saying you know oh no you want a girlfriend how horrific. Like, you must go and, you know, play your computer games forever. I mean, this is like um, sort of abnegation of our humanity, you know, or to, to say to men who are depressed, you know, oh, suck it up. I don't know. Maybe that would work in some some cases, right? But looking at the male suicide rates, like something's badly wrong here, right? Mm -hmm. This should be a matter of concern to all of us. You know, it's not great for women either that men feeling, are feeling suicidal, right? It's terrible, you know, and I think this thing about social role... Everybody sort of wants to feel recognised, they want to feel a certain belonging, they want to have a kind of mixed and interesting life. Um, and it sort of depends on all of us, you know. I think more more conversation, more listening, I don't know, nice, gentle things. One thing that middle. I find... She is a woman. <laughs> <laughs> nice, gentle, gentle things. things. <laughs> One of the things that I find particularly worrying, and I don't think we talk enough about, is... When you look at the younger generations, you know, people in their 20s, they're, they're not having sex. And that's really worrying. Really, really but worrying. Why, why does it worry you? I mean, I... I... Yeah, Francis, why does it worry you? It, it worries me because it shows that the sexes are further apart than ever before. It shows that we're not connecting. But, I mean, the kind of sexual revolution is, what, like 60 years old now? Mm -hmm. And... I mean, that's that's also a relatively novel way of behaving with each other. I don't necessarily think having hundreds of sexual partners is good for anybody. But then I also don't think it's good for people to be virgins until their 30s, which we're starting to see now. I, I think it's a very, very complicated question. It's also the question of whether people are going to have children or not, you know, which is also there's increasingly kind of antenatal narratives. I, you know, marriage is relatively unpopular. You know, these are kind of... Um, are also things that need to be discussed. I, I, I don't know on the sex question. I, I think 
I do think sex is an interesting form of communication. It doesn't have to be with the same person for, you know, forever. Um, but I also think at the other end, this kind of treating people as, as commodities, you know, there's actually a fear of intimacy at the heart of lots of um, random sex, you know, that actually what's not happening there is a kind of um, real relation with somebody else in their, in their uniqueness. You know, that actually sex just becomes something like a deliveroo, you know. So my friend had an, uh, asked his, his phone asked if he wanted to link up Grinder to deliveroo. You're like, that sounds like a this great is, night. This is very disturbing. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> right? You know, that, that you just sort of call someone like to your house and, and you know, it's like ordering a pizza. I mean, mm. there's something kind of, I don't know, maybe I'm old fashioned, but. Slightly. <laughs> it's ironic that in the world that that's we all three, I think, would agree is becoming feminized. Actually, the sexual marketplace is becoming extraordinarily male serving. That That is how a man thinks of sex. Mm-hmm. Press a button, it arrives. <laughs> that's how a man thinks of sex. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Nina. No, <laughs> did, no, did I, I mean... I, as far as I understand it on the apps, like it's something like 20% of men get 80% of women, right? right? Yeah. So that actually it's not true that this works out for men. For some men. It works out for some men. But what I yeah. mean is the mode of thinking about sex is like that. I don't think most women think about, in, in, in the traditional sense, would think about that whole process as being that way. Do you see what I'm saying? No, and again, this might be a difference we need to recognise, you know, like maybe there's a way that marriage civilised men. I think it does. I think women civilise men. I think men, I don't know, they do. 100%. Civilized women in a strange way, or maybe they animalize women. I don't know, but let's talk about it. (laughs) It's complicated. You know, marriage was a social technology that served a particular function, right? And that was good for children in general, right? I'm not saying all marriages are great. I'm not saying all families are, you know, without problems. There are lots of issues in particular instances, but it did address this problem, which is men's desire for sex. Okay, yes, you have to have sex with the same woman. Maybe the French solution, you can have a mistress, that's <laughs> fine. But you know what I mean? Like it, it kind of, um, it, it, it contains it in a way, you know? And I think this market, the marketization of everything is not the right way to go. In, you know, the marketization of sex, the commodification of human bodies is, um, is anti-human. It's what the elites want. And I don't think it's what most people want. Even even men who say they would like a lot of sex, I think in the end it's an empty and hollow process. And I talk about Rush B in the book, who is a pickup artist who's who's become very religious, and he's absolutely turned his back on this kind of um, pickup artistry thing because it's completely empty at the end of the day. What's the point in tricking women into having sex and having sex with hundreds of women, right? What does that actually get you? You know, it's momentary satisfaction. It's not real. I mean, it's it's not meaningful and it gets you a lot of emptiness too right and i completely agree with all of that but i think we skip past the point that it's very worrying that young people aren't having sex because it means they're not having relationships and i don't know any man who would be happy being a virgin until he was 28 maybe a small percentage might be but i think if they're deep down i think they'd be they wouldn't be happy about it so many jokes. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. I mean, if you think about kind of more traditional arrangements, it's like until a man got himself um, a job and had some mm. sort of status, then he wasn't able to kind of ask women to marry him. Mm. You know, um, there's not necessarily anything. But wrong that would with also that. happen much younger as well. Um, potentially. But lives were shorter, so in proportion yeah. to your life, it yeah. kind of would have happened at the same time. Yeah, I mean. I don't know that just sex for its own sake is good. I, I think there is a problem with touch. I talk about touch in the book. Mm. I think that a world without touch is like a part of the inhuman, you know, technocratic world. Um, and that's a bad thing. But there are lots, lots of different kinds of touch. And I think if you live in a hypersexualized culture, an oversexualized culture, it's a mistake to think that all touch is, is necessarily mm. sexual. You know, whereas if you live in a more, you know, a culture that is more into embracing and kissing and stroking and just being affectionate and all these different hundreds of different meanings of touch, most of which are not sexual, you know, that's a a more beautiful world, you know. So it's not against physicality, but I think, you know, I think we need to ask the question about the sexual revolution, as many people are doing. Like, was this actually liberating? I think it's been disastrous, actually, in loads of ways. particularly for women and children. You know, I, I think the unleashing of desire, particularly when it hits the political realm, is is absolutely horrific. I think this stuff should be um, 
privatized, you know, that the, we shouldn't have this kind of idea that all desires are good and, you know, the expression of desire is good. Like repression is useful. Like we need repression, right? It's, uh, it's important. Otherwise we wouldn't sort of, I don't know, make beautiful art. Apart from anything well, there's else. so many pieces to that. Uh, we, we, we did a great <laughs> interview with Mary Eberstad about this very issue, um, about the sexual revolution, some of the problems that it's caused. Mary Harrington? No, oh. Mary Eberstad. Oh, who's Mary Eberstad? Uh, she is a writer. She wrote a book called The Sexual... What, do you remember the title? Oh, something about the sexual revolution. Oh, okay. well, yeah, it's, she's, it, she's wonderful. She's very... It's, and her it's book basically, is brilliant as well. It's about how the sexual revolution created... The, the massive rise in single parenthood and all the ensuing consequences all the way through to the shit that we talk about every day, which is, you know, people with pink hair running around, tearing down <laughs> everything. Do you know what I mean? Um, but look, we've run out of time. So uh, before we ask our last question, kids, can you please start having sex? Because Francis is very concerned. <laughs> uh, but Nina, it's been a real pleasure. And look, I think we, we barely touched the surface in this conversation, really, of... of what are actually very important conversations. You know, one of the things I've always found very strange about the society we live in is somehow we've got to a point where men and women who through their entire history have had to work together to survive, yeah. barely survive together. And they've had to do everything to work together to just to just survive, have enough food for them and their children to, to pass on their genes. Suddenly we've got to a position where these two groups of people who've had to work together their entire history suddenly are antagonistic. I just think it's nonsense. Yeah, I and agree. I, th I, th I think men and women are fundamentally cooperative. Right. Yeah. The differences between us are complementary. They're not oppositional yes. in that way. But th that's where we are. These very basic things need to be said. So I I'm really glad we've had you on and it's great that your book is out finally. Uh, it's a pleasure having you on the show and we've just got one more question for you. Which is always, what's the one thing we're not talking about but we really should be? <sighs> I don't know. I feel like we've we've discussed all the questions we shouldn't be talking about um <laughs> we're not allowed to talk about um oh i don't know i think magic <laughs> tell us more i i think we need to to imagine the world re-enchanted and i think we live in a very disillusioned world in which we've forgotten all these kind of powers of of, of the spirits and energies and i think we should be thinking more along those lines it's a very good point uh, on that note, we've got a couple of questions for our supporters only on Locals, uh, which we'll ask you in a second. But in the meantime, uh, where can people get the book? When is it out? It'll probably be out by the time this interview goes out. Um, yes, yeah, so it's out on February the 3rd. Um, I recorded the audio book so you can hear me read it. Um, I guess it's available on Kindle. It's, it's published by Penguin. Um, and so You really work. You need to work <laughs> on your promotion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> go to Amazon or wherever. Right, sure. It's Good. probably on Amazon. Go to a bookseller. Exactly. <laughs> Great stuff, Nina. <laughs> well done. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. We hope you've enjoyed this fantastic interview. It's such a pleasure to have Nina in the studio. Uh, and we will see you very, very soon with another brilliant interview like this one or Raw or Show. All of them go out at 7 p.m. UK time. And for those of you who like your trigonometry on the go, it's also available as a podcast. Take care and see you soon, guys. Is there any empirical evidence for patriarchy in modern Western European society?